was here. Finally, I can unravel the mysteries of Risk of Rain. No more missing logs. The knowledge is my. God damn it. The release of 1.0 has been rather mixed across the crowd. While there is a lot of love in this update, like the final boss fight, the new directions they're taking the items in, and the cutscenes, many feel as if this is just another update and not really THE 1.0 update that would round out the game. With this update, you have to ask, does Risk of Rain feel like a full game in the current patch? I would say it almost does, but it still needs a bit more content to really make it feel satisfactory, and some logs still missing makes it hard to shake off the early access feeling. Regardless, this update did bring us a lot of lore. The logs that are here are rather good, eh, mostly. And they all help flesh out the world some more. The writing is of varying quality, as is to be expected, but their contents is what mostly matters in the end. I will discuss endgame content here, so if I've not fought the final boss, then go do that, and then return to watch the video. Let me set up what we have learned from this new update in a concrete and rapid fashion. Oh, and for the record, I'm aware we're getting more lore in the future, but I'm just going to talk about how I perceive things as of now. An update being titled 1.0 should make it stand on its own feet, without the crutches of future patches. The main villain behind the game is the fan named Providence, or as he's actually called, Mifrix, King of Nothing. Mifrix has a similar appearance to Providence, with a one-eyed visage, he also fights like Providence, snappy, fast, and wields a big weapon. He's also trapped on the moon and talks about a brother. This HAS to be the brother of Providence. If it isn't, then Hopo is doing some really malicious misdirection. To recap from the earlier videos, this is the design obsessed deity-like entity that has clashed with his brother, then he got exiled to the moon by said brother, trash-talked him, and then later got killed by the UES agents. The last one is me speculating a bit, since I don't think the ending would make sense if it was Akri that killed him. Or Rex even. But that's a topic for another time. Interestingly enough, when he dies he calls for his brother, begging him for help, longing for him, and even suggesting that they might make it right next time. Next time? Well, that's more fuel to the time loop theory, I suppose. Unless they're talking about rebirth of some kind. But what we see here is that even the fiercest bitterness will wash away under the crushing tide of imminent death. Ifrix is a perplexing figure. When he and Providence were young, they would frolic around some gravity wells. They messed about and threw in whatever compounds they could find. But nothing that was alive. It's special, not worms. You see, Providence loves worms. Ifrix, however, was a curious type and cared little for the lives of others, as we have seen multiple times in the past logs. Naturally, he threw in a worm. He threw in many worms, actually, while Providence was not looking. But one day, Providence was actually looking. I suppose that was where the division started, although the log ends right after that note. Our king of nothing isn't painted in the most flattering way, from his cruel nature, selfish ambition, and very frail and dusty look. More on that later, there's other goodies in this update to dissect. Some other things we learned was that the alley vultures are incredibly intelligent and can even use firearms. Which is certainly an interesting imagery. I can imagine this would make for very great fan art. Huntress is a bounty hunter and not a jewel thief. Praise Providence, I was a bit disappointed that they were going to make her a petty jewel thief, but the bait and switch at the end really worked. The year 2056 is as prominent as ever. Uh, Primus 5, which is the planet in the Roarverse, had a class revolution akin to the French Revolution, even with the old guillotines, albeit it was far more literal with the elite using actual currency as weapons to suppress the lower classes. We also learned the Soulbound Catalyst is related to the Old King from the Wicked Ring log. Our Light was made by Providence and sealed away by Mifrix because he was made with an error in design. This is why he actually shifts sides whenever you beat it. Interestingly enough, the titans are weak because Mifrix designed them, while Iran Light is a providence at hand, which makes him far stronger, but less loyal. We also got You Are Killing Me, repeated numerous times. Artificer is now part of a high council of space cultists that believe heaven is a planet and not a realm. I'm guessing that planet is the Risk of Rain planet, which now is canonically called Petriarcher 5, like the song composed by Chris Chris Duel. Also interesting is that the Maltese log gave us a lot of info not only Maltese, but also Chef. I would have guessed that, 
We learn the multi robots are made with these chips that have a learning module which is disabled. This is so the company can resell new chips with better capabilities rather than allowing the robot that uses the chip to learn new tasks over time. The chef robots however do not have this feature disabled, and it does make me wonder if the reason Chef went crazy in Risk of Rain 1 is because of this learning module. The multi log shows us two workers fixing a multi unit after he's been dented, and also for fun giving him the learning chip so they can teach him to, I kid you not, flip off someone. Very um, quaint. Regardless, one of them shows Multi a picture of Ron from Corporate, and it's filled to the brim with holes. The worker asks Multi to do that to him next time you see him. I suppose he meant to flip him off, but I have a feeling that the unspecified command and the picture will most likely lead to Multi forcing Ron to do a Swiss cheese impersonation with a nail gun. If you know what I mean. Doesn't help that the multi unit seemingly didn't forget that command. Now we want to move over to the UES company. In the captain's survivor log, we see that UES is talking about setting up a top secret rescue mission to save the survivors of the UES contact light. And the cargo, I presume. UES prioritizes profit over ethics after all. They're traveling with the ship Safe Travels, which is not a rescue ship. And also naming a spaceship that just feels like daring fate to mess you up. They arm the ship and go to the planet, or the last known location of the US contact light. But the bioscanner is dark. I suppose they don't detect any friendly life or survivors. I'm sure they take plenty of hostile life, however. Now here's a bit where Risk of Rain 2 lore loses me. You see, in Risk of Rain 1, the lore held the depth of the story and fleshed it out, but the narrative itself worked very well, and more importantly, it gave the characters logical motivations. A deity-like figure crashes your ship and kills almost everyone. You land on an ominously hostile planet, get to the shipwreck to make an attempt to escape, and desperate for survival you utilize the items, some with horrible side effects to mind and body. After you get to the US contact light ship wreckage, you attempt to start it up, but the same entity that crashed the ship stops you. He attacks you and you retaliate. In killing him, you not only avenge your comrades, but also get to leave the planet albeit with crushing guilt and not the same person as you were when you landed on the planet. In Risk of Rain 2, you are an organized rescue mission. Albeit the bioscanner shows no life, it couldn't hurt to check anyways. You might even find some extra stuff to recover as well. A lot of the cargo is rather valuable. Therefore, you go on the planet and you find no survivors, only monsters and cargo. The only logical step then is to go to the moon and kill a banished deity. No sarcasm if you couldn't tell. Motivations behind attacking the moon seem incredibly sudden. Now there was a statement that Mifrix was eyeing Earth, or a planet of water and dirt, to conquer and potentially destroy. However, the EUSC company could hardly know that. So I really don't believe that saving Earth was their motivation to go to the moon and kill Mifrix. Also, Mifrix showing potential of being a bit of a destructive bastard does give Providence motivation and more reason as to why he sealed him off to the moon. Providence seems to have a level of care for planet Earth, or worries about it rather. If USC's motivation was revenge, then the Risk of Rain 1's drive already sorted them out. To be fair, the company wouldn't really know who to strike vengeance on in regards to crashing the contact light, and just struck whoever they thought was behind it all. Still, that's really flimsy motivation. It does however paint the USC in an even more pitiful light, which is fair since USC is not a good company, but as a driving force for the main character, it's weak. Additionally, the horrible things you did to yourself in Risk of Rain 1 made sense, as it was a genuinely uncertain situation you had found yourself in, and you had to do whatever you could to strive. There was a real sense of desperation to it all. You used cursed artifacts and medical enhancements with horrible risk to them, and even bore witness to the kind of stuff that USC transports. Of course, not all items are horrible, like the lens maker's glasses, the rusty knife and gasoline are tactical items that I doubt really affected this driver that badly. But the point still stands that using salves that caused misaligned bone growth or letting a mushroom grow itself inside you made sense when it was all you got. It couldn't be picky. Not so much when you have an organized rescue mission with backup and plenty of supplies, I hope. You wouldn't really go to a mission like this unprepared. The captain even equipped the ship with armaments beforehand, and he can call in airstrikes to support him. You are not alone on this planet. 
It almost doesn't feel like you're the underdog here. Mechanically, the item infusing is a risk operating staple, but thematically it doesn't work as well in risk operating 2 now that we know how we got here. It might make sense for Aqua Div and Rex as they are kind of the outcast of the survivors we can play as, but not Commando or whoever else is an ESC worker. Now I don't mean that the items have to make logical sense, a robot is utilizing the blood of animals for crying out loud, but the core concept of the item gathering has been weakened now that the desperation is out of the picture. USC must be paying their workers a generous sum, given they even stab and burn themselves to get combat advantages. With how Mifrix is ascribed to not really care for living beings and beans, <laughs> with how Mifrix is ascribed to not care for living beings and even threatening to destroy a planet which might be Earth, Risk of Rain 2 seems to be going for a less morally grey story and instead focus on how a group of cool mercenaries take down a trapped deranged deity. It's also working really hard to make Providence seem even better retrospectively. The Shrivers are given far much love and described as competent, talented and rugged. Unlike the description of the Scopain 1 Shriver, which didn't really care for their backstory. We know that they were a curious type and had been on the Earth before. But that didn't matter as much as how they reacted to the planet and its inhabitants. How it felt like every fiber of the planet is going out of its way to end them. That made the Shriver easier to sympathize with and gave us more to consider when we thought about the creatures we were massacring. I am not going to pretend that the Risk of Rain 1 monster logs hold a candle to some of the literature that has been published in our world, but they are still surprisingly well written, and they make the Risk of Rain 1 survivor one of my all time favorite video game characters, and I don't even know who they are. I think that puts into perspective how strongly written I feel the character is. Regardless, I am rather interested in seeing where Hopo Games takes the lore after this. While the motives as of now make little sense and the theming is a bit weakened, I still think this can be taken into an interesting direction that provides a story which can give us something different than Risk of Pain 1. I welcome that, but as it stands right now the 1.0 update gives us a lot of new information, but it also gives us a lot of things to scratch our heads at, as it does every update. I think I'm sensing a pattern here. Thank you all so very much for watching and sticking it out to the end. I am sorry it took so long to make a new video. I can't really vouch for how my production will be because university is starting, but I just gave you a video so let's not think about that, eh? I hope you're all enjoying the 1.0 update and I'm going to call it quits for now because this blanket I'm recording under is killing me with the heat. Farewell and have a cozy evening. Fly me.